what do you believe in? In the movie version of Cormac McCarthy's play, The Sunset Limited, two nameless characters debate the meaning of life, the existence of God. One is an ex-convict and a Christian, played by Samuel L. Jackson. The other is a professor and an atheist, played by Tommy Lee Jones. Now the play opens with the two of them conversing in the ex-convict's flat. We later learn from their conversation that the professor had tried to commit suicide by leaping in front of the oncoming train known as the Sunset Limited. The ex-convict saved his life by pulling him back onto the platform. We join them in mid-conversation. What is it you believe in? A lot of things. All right. All right, what? All right, what things? I believe in things. Give me a for instance. Um, cultural things, for instance, books, music, art, things like that. All right. Those are the things that have value to me. They're the foundations of civilization. Well, they used to have value to me. I don't have so much value anymore, I guess. What happened to them? People stopped valuing them. I stopped valuing them to a certain extent. I'm not sure I can tell you why. And that world is largely gone now. It's soon it will be wholly gone. I'm not sure I'm following you, Professor. There's nothing to follow. It's all right. The things I loved were very frail, very fragile. I didn't know that. I thought they were indestructible. They weren't. And that's what sent you off the edge of the platform? It wasn't nothing personal? Oh, it's personal. That's what an education does. It makes the world personal. Well, them some very powerful words, Professor, and, and I can't say that I got an answer to none of that. And, and it might be that there ain't no answer. But still, I got to ask, what's the use of having notions such as them if they won't keep you glued down to the platform when the Sunset Limiters come through at 80 miles an hour? I Good question. So. I thought so. What do you value in life? Books, music, art, says the professor. These are the things that have value to me. But he has since lost faith in those things. As he says, people stopped valuing them. I stopped valuing them. That world is largely gone now. Soon it will be wholly gone. Why had the professor become so disillusioned? So disillusioned that he wanted to end his life. C.S. Lewis explains in his sermon entitled The Weight of Glory as follows. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our past, our good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. A good book, music that moves you with power and passion, art whose beauty transcends words, great scientific breakthroughs, these are the things that we contemplate, that we treasure, that we value. These offer a glimpse of the divine. But when we mistake the glimpse of the divine for the divine itself, when such things, as, as good as they are, become, as Tim Keller puts it, more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life, or identity, they become your idols. And once they become your idols, they will break your heart. Or as in the words of the American novelist, David Foster Wallace, they will eat you alive. Perhaps the most um, uh, sad and poignant of my 
examples tonight, and this is, I, uh, I always shudder a little bit when I read it, is David Foster Wallace, who was a, um, a great uh, writer. He was a novelist, uh, an American novelist. At least I don't have any idea, frankly, how well known he was across the world. But in America, he was one of the leading lights of, of postmodern uh, novelists and writers. And he was highly respected and loved. Uh, and um, a couple of years ago, he committed suicide in his late 40s. Not too long before he committed suicide, he gave a commencement address at a liberal arts college. And this commencement address, as soon as it was given, was noted by many people as being unusual because David Foster Wallace, like a lot of postmodern uh, writers, is impenetrable. He's a very hard, you know, when you read his work, you have no idea what it means. And uh, you're supposed to sit and discuss it and think about it, and that's, it, that's the point. Uh, many, folks have off, have, many folks pointed out that this, uh, this commencement speech was very, very lucid, unusually lucid and direct. Uh, and accessible, but it was not long before he killed himself, and listen to this. He says in the commencement address, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And a compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some inviolable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious, the insidious thing, thing about, these about all these forms of worship is that they're unconscious. They are default settings. Now I do not know enough about David Foster Wallace to uh, speculate exactly on the relationship between what he said here to his suicide, though everybody says there's some kind of link. I think we can be confident to say that it was something that ate him alive. One of the things in this list, or maybe something he didn't list, ate him alive. And he says Unless you have a God who can deliver on the hopes that you put in these things, it's going to eat you alive. What the world proclaims as the way to happiness and self-fulfillment, the accumulation of wealth and power, the attainment of status and admiration, lavish consumption of food and drink, sexual gratification without distinguishing between lust and love. Henry Nowen describes these as addictions. And these addictions create expectations that cannot but fail to satisfy our deepest needs. And as long as we live within the world's delusions, our addictions condemn us to futile quests in the distant country, leaving us to face an endless series of disillusionments while our sense of self remains unfulfilled. Henry Nowen previously taught at the University of Notre Dame in the divinity schools of Yale and Harvard before he left academia to join L'Arche Daybreak near Toronto. He assisted those helping them with those with developmental disabilities. In his book, A Story of Homecoming, Nowen describes how inspired he was in his own spiritual journey 
by Rembrandt's painting entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son. Jesus tells the story about a young man, the younger of two sons. It is the story of the prodigal son. This young man demands that his father immediately give him his inheritance. The son takes that inheritance, leaves home, travels to a, a distant land, a distant country. He wastes all his money in wild, self-indulgent living. He eventually loses everything and ends up desperately poor. In order to survive, he is forced to take care of pigs. Desperate and alone, the son quickly discovers how conditional is this world's love. Now one says this, the, the world says, yes, I love you if you are good looking, intelligent, and wealthy. I love you if you have a good education, a good job, good connections. I love you if you produce much, sell much, and buy much. There are endless ifs in the world's love. The world's love is, and always will be, conditional. And as long as I keep looking for my true self in the world of conditional love, I will remain hooked to the world, trying, failing, and trying again, it is a world that fosters addictions because what it offers cannot satisfy the deepest craving of my heart. What is that deepest craving of my heart? C.S. Lewis describes that deepest craving as the longing to be acknowledged, to be accepted, to be welcomed by God. Or as he puts it, to be noticed by God. It is the door on which we have been knocking all our lives. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, knowing full well the suffering and death that awaited him there. He was passing through a city, the city of Jericho. And in his gospel account, Luke tells us that there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the chief tax man, very rich, but also very much detested by everyone because he cheated everyone. Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus and he was curious to see Jesus. But Zacchaeus was a short man, so there's no way that he was going to see Jesus with a crowd that surrounded Jesus. So Zacchaeus ran on ahead. He climbed up into a tree so that he could see Jesus when Jesus would pass by. And when Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. Jesus didn't just notice Zacchaeus. Jesus called him by name. What would you do if Jesus were to speak to you? What would you do if Jesus was to speak to you? <laughs> do you imagine that he might? No, I don't. But, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not virtuous enough. No, Professor, it ain't nothing like that. You ain't got to be virtuous. You just has to be quiet. Now, I can't speak for the Lord, but it has been my experience that he will talk to anybody who will listen. Zacchaeus called Jesus. Hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. This crooked tax man, unloved, despised by the world, was precisely the person that Jesus wanted to have dinner with. And not only was Jesus willing to speak with this known sinner, he was even willing to go to his home, have fellowship with him, eat with him. Well, Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree. He was delighted to take Jesus home with him. But the crowd around Jesus saw what was happening, and they were astonished. They were shocked. They were offended. Why is Jesus being so friendly with this crook? But like light overcomes darkness. Being in the company of Jesus never leaves one unchanged. And that night, Zacchaeus became a changed man. He gave, he gave half of what he owned to the poor. 
He paid back four times over what he owed to people that he had cheated. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And today, salvation has come to this home. Brennan Manning's personal struggle with alcohol addiction made him all the more passionate in his preaching about God's unconditional love. Manning writes this, my, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ. And I have done nothing, I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. Yes, called you by name, not to scold or frighten or threaten, but to make you aware, aware, with new depth and greater dimension of his relentless tenderness of his passion in pursuing, healing, reconciling what Chesterton called the furious love of God incarnate in Christ Jesus. After spending time in Jericho, as he was leaving the city, Jesus passed by a blind beggar. The writer of Mark's Gospel tells us the blind beggar's name was Bartimaeus. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began yelling, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Uh, people that were accompanying Jesus, the crowd, they, they told the blind man, be quiet. But he yelled all the louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. And he said to those around him, call him over. Get up, the people told Bartimaeus. Jesus is calling you to come. So throwing off his coat, Bartimaeus was up on his feet at once, came to Jesus. What can I do for you? asked Jesus. Rabbi, answered Bartimaeus, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus, your faith has saved and healed you. And instantly, Bartimaeus could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. Remember, Jesus is on his way to the cross. That is his destination. He stops. Mark tells us that Jesus stood still. He hears Bartimaeus' cries of desperation. He hears. He stops. He heals. Do you believe in miracles? In that same commencement address, David Foster Wallace told the following story. There are two guys sitting in a bar in a remote Alaskan wilderness. One of the guys is religious. The other is an atheist. And the two are arguing about the existence of God. And the atheist says this, Look, it's not like I don't have actual reasons for not believing in God. It's not like I haven't experimented with the whole God in prayer thing. Just last month, I got caught away from camp in that terrible blizzard. I was totally lost. I couldn't see a thing. It was 50 below, and I tried it. I fell to my knees in the snow and cried out, Oh God, if there is a God... I'm lost in this blizzard. I'm going to die if you don't help me. Now they're sitting there in the bar, and the religious guy looks at the atheist, and he's puzzled. Well then, you must believe now. After all, you are alive. And the atheist just rolls his eyes. No man. All that was was a couple of Eskimos happened to come wandering by, and showed me the way back to camp. Do you believe in miracles? To believe in miracles, writes C.S. Lewis, one must believe in a reality beyond nature. Meaning that if you begin with the premise that there is no God, there are no miracles. Down here in the physical world, argued the philosopher Wittgenstein, one has the facts of natural science. 
We live in what Wittgenstein referred to as the, the downstairs of reason. On the other hand, everything that makes life worthwhile, what gives meaning to life, what, what binds it together, it's in the upstairs of total silence. The upstairs of total silence, unless there is someone upstairs who speaks Unless there is that person up there who speaks, we would be left with nothing to say about what is upstairs. But God is there. And He has not been silent. Reading from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Beyond that even which we can behold in creation, an even greater revelation took place when God entered human history as one of us. And He didn't come in power. He came in the most vulnerable way possible. As a baby born to an unwed mother in a stable. In John's Gospel we read, the Word became flesh. God incarnate and made His dwelling among us. God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. God has come in the person of Jesus Christ, to redeem His lost sons and daughters. On a small scale, person to person, like He did with Zacchaeus, like He did with Bartimaeus, Jesus reached out with compassion and with healing. He performed miracles. The miracles, writes C.S. Lewis, are a retelling in small, of the very same story which is written across the whole world in letters too large for some of us to see. In Jesus Christ, the material and the spiritual, the downstairs and the upstairs are joined as one. Because of His great love for us, Jesus came not just to live among us, but to die for us. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Because no matter how much God loves us, He cannot ignore our sin. There must be justice because God is holy and just. And justice demands a penalty must be paid for wrongdoing. God cannot allow sin and injustice to go unaccounted for. So what did God do? He came Himself and paid the penalty for us. Jesus came to be that perfect sacrifice taking our sins on Himself. For whatever reason, as Philip Yancey puts it, God has chosen to respond to the human predicament, not by waving a magic wand to make evil and suffering disappear, but by absorbing it in His person, in Himself. But the story of our redemption doesn't end with Jesus on a cross or even in a tomb. The tomb is empty. The body is gone. Jesus is alive. Now you'll remember, after Jesus was arrested, during His trial, what happened to His disciples? All of His disciples deserted Him. And then after the crucifixion, where did they go? They went into hiding. But suddenly, overnight, they became changed men. They were willing to suffer persecution. They were willing to die. Die for what purpose? To preach the gospel that Jesus was re resurrected. As one author has put it, faith did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created faith. Without the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, believing in Jesus would be no different from believing in any other great teacher. But He is alive. I follow a risen Savior, not a dead teacher. 
looking back to when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, we begin to see a pattern emerging. And in this pattern, God seems to turn what looks like apparent defeat into decisive victory. Philip Yancey tells the following story. Jerry Sitzer is a professor at Whitworth College. Twenty years ago, Jerry was driving a minivan with his family inside of it. A drunk driver was speeding down the road the opposite direction, missed a curve, jumped a lane, and crashed right into his minivan. Jerry's wife, mother, four-year-old daughter were all killed. And his three surviving children had significant injuries. Jerry wrote two books. The first book, written some 20 years ago, is entitled A Grace Disguised, in which he details the stages of grief that he went through and the difficulties that he had coping as a single parent with a full-time job. He says this, I remember sinking into my favorite chair night after night, feeling so exhausted and anguished that I wondered whether I could survive another day, whether I wanted to survive another day. I felt punished simply by being alive and thought death would bring welcome relief. Twenty years later, he wrote a follow-up book, and that book is entitled A Grace Revealed. And in the final chapter, he writes this, Eventually, we will live happily ever after. But only when the redemptive story ends, which seems a long way off. In the meantime, you and I are somewhere in the middle of the story, as if stuck in the chaos and messiness of a half-finished home improvement project. We might have one chapter left in our story, or we might have 50. We could experience more of the same for years to come, or we could be on the verge of a change so dramatic that if we knew about it, we could faint with fear or wonder, or perhaps both. We could be entering the happiest phase of our lives, or the saddest. We simply don't know. In my mind, there is only one good option. We must choose to stay in the redemptive story. However unclear it might be to us, we can trust that God is writing the story. Jesus' disciples stayed in the story. And what kept them in the story was their faith. Faith grounded in the reality of Jesus' miraculous resurrection. It is the same with Jerry Sitzer. It is what has kept him in God's redemptive story. What keeps you in the story, no matter the circumstances? Rembrandt was close to death when he painted the return of the prodigal son. Most likely, it was one of his, if not the last, of his works. Now, in that story, the prodigal son, having lost all hope, utterly desperate, the prodigal son now decides to return to his father. And Rembrandt shows the son on his knees in the full embrace of his father. Our attention is drawn to the hands of the Father. The light shines there. The left hand is strong, muscular. It not only touches, but it also holds the Son's shoulder. It grasps. The right hand, some have described as almost feminine. It is softer. It gently rests on the Son's shoulder. There is gentleness, there is strength in the Father's loving touch. 
Nowen writes this. From the deep inner place where love embraces all human grief, the Father reaches out to His children. The touch of His hands radiating inner light seeks only to heal. There is a line from a song which goes like this. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. One of the greatest challenges of the spiritual life right now is this, is to receive God's forgiveness. There is something in us humans that keeps us clinging to our sins and prevents us from letting God erase our past and offer us a completely new beginning. Sometimes it seems as though I want to prove to God that my darkness is too great to overcome, writes now. What blocks forgiveness is not God's reluctance to give it, but ours to receive it. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied him. Both were lost children. Judas lost sight of the fact that he, he remained God's child. No matter what he had done, no matter his sin, he forgot that he was God's child still. He hung himself. Peter, even in the midst of his despair, he knew that he was beloved by God, and with many tears he repented and returned. Judas chose the way of death. Peter chose life. Now when he writes this, I realize that this choice is always before me. Constantly I am tempted to wallow in my own lostness and lose touch with my original goodness, my God-given humanity, my basic blessedness, and thus allow the powers of death to take charge. Many people live with this dark inner sense of themselves. And in contrast to the prodigal, they let the darkness absorb them so completely that there is no light left to turn toward and return to. They might not kill themselves physically, but spiritually, they are no longer alive. You ask me what I'm a professor of. I am a professor of darkness, the night and day's clothing. And now I wish you all the very best, but I must go. Just stay a little while longer. No, no more time. Goodbye. We can talk about something else, I swear. I don't want to talk about something else. Don't go out there, Professor. You know what's out there. Oh, yes. Indeed I do. I know what's out there, and I know who is out there. I rushed to nuzzle his bony cheek, no doubt. He will be surprised to find himself so cherished. And as I cling to his neck, I will whisper in that dry and ancient ear, Here I am. Here I am. Now open the door. Don't do this. You're, you're a kind man. I've heard you out. You've heard me. There's more to say. Your God must once have stood in a dawn of infinite possibilities in that is what he's made of it. You tell me that I want God's love. I don't. Perhaps I want forgiveness, but there's no one to ask it of. And there's no going back. There's no setting things right. There's only the hope of nothingness, and I cling to that hope. Now, open the door. Don't do this. Please. Open the door.
We are free to love or free to leave. In response to the December 2012 shootings at that Sandy Hook Elementary School, 20 children, six adults were shot and killed. Charles Chappie, Archbishop of Philadelphia, he wrote this. God is good, but we human beings are free. And being free, we help fashion the nature of our world with the choices that we make. Why does God allow war? Why does God allow hunger? We're free, and therefore responsible for both the beauty and the suffering that we help make. Why does God allow wickedness? He allows it because we or others just like you choose it. The only effective antidote to the wickedness around us is to live differently from this moment forward, to make a choice. Because he loves you, God gives you the freedom to love him, to love him in return or simply to walk away. But once I walk away from God, I am leaving home behind. And the farther I run away from the place where God dwells, the less I am going to be able to hear that voice that calls me his beloved. And the less that I hear that voice, the more entangled I become in the manipulations and the power games of this world. Where are you? Are you still in that distant country? Are you far from home? Or are you ready? to come home. Come home to the embrace of an all-loving Father who gently calls you by name. Come home to the place where you can find joy that the world cannot give. In Jesus' story, even, even while the prodigal son was a long way off, the Father saw him coming. He ran to him. He hugged him. He kissed him. Hurry, the father tells the servants. Bring the best clothes and put them on him. Give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Get the best calf and prepare it so we can eat and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but now has come back to life. He was lost and now has been found. And they began to celebrate. God's invitation to come is an invitation to joy. Come home. Make your home in God. And He will come and make His home in you. The Spirit of God in you. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead comes into your life and makes His home in you. It is not some external force and power that we are talking about. It, instead, it is the personal God in whose image you have been made that comes to live inside you. And with the Spirit of God inside you, you will discover, as Nowen writes so well, the lasting beyond the passing. The eternal beyond the temporal, the perfect love beyond all paralyzing fears, and the divine consolation beyond the desolation of human anguish and agony. The presence of God can already now be seen, heard, and touched by those who are Willing to believe. Willing to be touched. God Himself is the miracle you need. The Gospel is all about the miraculous. 
From the miracle of the incarnation to the miracle of the resurrection to the miracle of God in you. Let God be the miracle in your life. He invites you to come. Come, just as you are. Fall in His arms. Admit you are a sinner. You are in need of forgiveness. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you just as you are. Not as you should be. In the words of Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, we beg you, I beg you, not to toss aside this marvelous message of God's great kindness. Right now, God is ready to welcome you. Today, He is ready to save you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your great love, for sending Jesus to come to die for us, to rise again so that we have a risen Savior. Thank You for the promise and the hope that You will come into our lives if we will come to You. What I would like to ask is while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you would like to come to, to Jesus, if today is the day of salvation, then pray this prayer with me. Just quietly in your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen.